Hi listeners, welcome back to Judaism, Christianity, A Contrast. This is our seventh program and will be our last program in this series. Um, I'm joined again by the author of the book, Judaism, Christianity, A Contrast, which you can um, buy from spiritualbabies.net on the recommended reading page, and uh, the author of the website, whatjewsbelieve.org. I recommend that you go there and have a look at all the fantastic essays and all the extra content that's on there. Rabbi Stuart Federer, welcome back. It's good to be back, and I'm saddened by the fact that this is the seventh and last. Oh, well, only only in this iteration. We'll, well, good, we'll, thank we'll, you. Yeah, we'll find some some plausible reason to make more videos. Okay, so um, I thought I think we've kind of left the best to last <laughs> because uh, this week we're going to have a look at the um, essay. Uh, Jews believe there is a Satan or the Satan, but we do not believe there is the devil. Right. Um, I suppose the with the preface for this is that in Judaism there is one God and He created everything. And explicitly stated in the Bible in the book of Isaiah also creates evil. Right. Jason, I have an introduction to Judaism conversion class, and one year there was a minister who decided to find out directly from the mouth of the Jews what the Jews believe. First day we went through a number of uh, verses, and it included the verses from uh, Job and from Isaiah and uh, all about the Satan. And when I ex expressed the concept that God not only creates good but also creates evil, he got very upset, this minister, and argued with me. And I said, but the text it explicitly says, yeah. I create light and create darkness. I create good and create evil. Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 7. He got up and walked out. He could not deal with the idea that God also creates evil. I think that is, it's a hard premise, especially for someone that comes from a faith like Christianity, where you are told that everything good comes from God and everything bad comes from the devil. It's, it's and, that's, and that's why they invented the concept, or not invented, but stole it actually from numerous other sources, because of that very reason. They want to see God as pure and good, who fights against a God of evil, and therefore frees God from the responsibility of creating evil. So um, I want to read the first um, paragraph of your essay, and then we'll have a look at some of the examples that you're listing that pertain to what you just said. In short, for Jews, anything that even remotely conflicts with the idea that God is one and indivisible will be rejected out of hand because it precludes p true, pure monotheism. The idea that there is a God in heaven above who fights against the God of the underworld or, or hell is not monotheism. It is, however, the same duality found in other pagan faiths. The Bible speaks of a character known as the Satan, who acts like a prosecuting attorney or district attorney in God's court. However, this Satan has no power or authority in and of himself. Rather, he must get permission from the judge, God, to do anything. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the, the, uh, remember that in Job, the Satan is among the other angels because the Satan is also an angel. He has a specific task to do. That's what the word the Satan means, the accuser, the adversary. In, in Judaism, is there a belief or a tradition that, that there is one particular angel that fulfills that role? Or, or do you think that maybe um, angels are kind of um, a Swiss army knife? And, and if, if that's the message they have to deliver or the task they have to do... I mean, I'm just wondering whether there's a the devil, the well, Satan, or whether it's kind of a, a fit thing. Anyone, anyone can do it. The, the problem is, is that the Satan is actually a title. It is. It, look, if I say, um, if, if someone calls out to me, "Hi, Rabbi, how are you?" Then they're using the word Rabbi as a name. But if they're talking to somebody else and they mention the Rabbi, then the term the Rabbi becomes a title to a, with a specific job description. Mm. And in the biblical text, almost every single time, the text does not read Satan, it reads the Satan, Hasatan. Not just Satan, but Hasatan, the Satan. And it therefore renders it into, even grammatically, 
a, like a title. And so as a title, it could be fulfilled, I assume, by other angels. But I do believe that in Jewish tradition, it really is one single angel who is the Satan. Yeah, I was just curious. I'd have to, I'd have to, I'd have to do more research on that. Mm, yeah. Okay, so um, obviously in uh, Christianity, because we, we have to go that route too, Satan is uh, Lucifer um, or, or Beelzebub or any other number of, of names. And um, well, actually, it, it, it's, it's almost like a progression. And remember, everything comes into uh, Christianity from paganism because Christianity is based on paganism, not on Judaism. Okay, so you have to go back. When they did excavations in Ras Shamra, which is on the Mediterranean coast on the northern part of Syria, uh, they found what are called the Ras Shamra texts. In the Ras Shamra text, they described the Canaanite god of the underworld called Athtar. The Rashamra texts read, Then Athtar, the awesome, climbed Mount Savon, ascended the throne of Baal the Almighty, but his feet did not reach the footstool, his head did not touch the headrest. Then Athtar, the awesome, spoke, I cannot serve as king, I cannot dwell on the heights of Zaphon. So Athtar, the awesome, descended, stepped down from the throne of Baal the Almighty, he became king of the underworld, lord of the river of the dead. In other words, you have a angel or some figure of of uh, of the heavenly world, shall we say, mm -hmm. who tries to replace Baal the Almighty, like a rebellion. Yep. And then cannot succeed and gets thrown down to the underworld to become lord of the river of the dead. Sound familiar? It does sound like a blueprint for a lot of other stories. Exactly. You also have similarities of, of this kind of thing with Greece, with Zeus and Hades, with Rome, with Jupiter and Pluto. The Norse equivalent is Odin and Loki. Mesopotamia had Marduk and Tiamat. Zoroastrian had uh, Ahura Mazda and Angra Mainyu. And of course, Christianity has God and the devil. It's a duality. The, the links between uh, the Greek and Roman um, myths and uh, Christian stand out for me quite poignantly, not just in this, but in lots of other stories. And that's why I always say the Judeo-Christian tradition is a myth. There's a Judeo-Christian values because there are overlapping values among all religions, but the, there's books upon books upon books called the myth of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, and, and it talks about it, the mythology and why it developed. If we're, looking at the, the, if we're looking at the word Satan first, Yes. But, um, Satan appears as an as kind of an action too, doesn't it? In Numbers twenty two twenty two, um, when the angel stands up against um, ba Balaam and his donkey, um, the angel is saturning the donkey. Right, he's um, going as an adversary against it. It's used almost like the word um, roadblock. Right. That's exactly it. Yeah. The, the angel, uh, God's anger was killed because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. It's like as a roadblock. Yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't even think to equate that angel with the Satan. The word is the same. It's just in that, yes. in that instance, they right. translated it the right way, but there are other passages where they'll translate it a different way to suit, to suit their agenda. Yes, that's true. So um, we're looking at some of the verses, right? For example, in your essay, you mentioned Isaiah 14, 4 through to 14. Yes. That's um, quite a famous one that mentions the name Lucifer. You have to be a bit of a scientist to understand what's going on there. Okay, the word Lucifer uh, means, means light bearer. And it's a reference to uh, Venus, the morning star. Which was the first star you would see in the in the evening, and the last one you'd see in the morning, right? It was the lowest, brightest yes, planet but, on the horizon. <laughs> but remember what happens when it's on the horizon. It appears to fall to a place underneath the horizon. So it looks like it's falling from heaven. And then at, on the other side, scientifically it has to be on the other side of the earth, is the place where the sun would rise. So as the sun rises the morning star drops, goes down. And, and the place in Isaiah, the reference there, uh, is 
is a is like a taunt against the king of Babylon, and it says uh, in Isaiah fourteen four, "Thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon." So the whole paragraph of Isaiah fourteen four to fourteen is talking about the king of Babylon, and it likens the king who was once great as someone who fell. Okay, and, and likens him to the morning star. Because as the morning star goes down and the sun comes up, it's as if it's fallen from heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which thou didst weaken the nations? And the idea is, is that this king thought himself to be God. Not a good idea for a human to do. I mean, imagine that, a human who thinks he's God or God becoming human. And so, basically, uh, he loses his throne. But the Christians there will latch on to this and say that this refers to the Satan falling from the heavens, which is a concept they get, as I said, from the myth about Aftar. But Satan isn't actually mentioned in that verse, right? No, Satan's not there anywhere. No. And, and it's, it typically it, says it's against the king of Babylon. I find, and it's interesting that people associate the word Lucifer with Satan, even though Lucifer only occurs one time in the whole of the Hebrew text. Right. But if it fits the model, you know, the typology, as they will say, uh, of the story of that they get from pagan sources of a fallen angel who tried to rebel against God, they latch on to it and, and give it the interpretation they need to validate their uh, pagan-sourced belief. By the way, you do know that uh, in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Jesus himself is also referred to as the same light-bearer, Venus, morning star, Lucifer. That's very interesting, isn't it? And when, when um, I bring that up, there's generally a whole gymnastics. Um, <laughs> it's a whole gymnastics show as people backflip and try to work out why that is or isn't the same um, thing. I, I find it very interesting. And I think there's a uh, Revelations. I think also mentions the Morning Star. It's also interesting that Christianity sets up this duality, this polytheism of God in heaven above and the the devil on earth below in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, where the word theos, which is like where we get the word theology from, mm -hmm. theos means God, is the exact word referred to, is used to refer to both the devil and to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, in whom the God, theos, of this world hath blinded the, wind, the, the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, Theos again, should shine unto them. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four, the word Theos is used is means God, and it's first were used to refer to the devil, but also the same word Theos is used to refer to God. So God is the heaven in, in the heaven above, and devil is the God of the earth. That's two gods. That's polytheism. That's why Judaism has to reject that idea of the Satan. But Christianity absolutely needs to have a devil. <clears throat> uh, it needs to have that um, that force for bad um, because it takes some of the weight off a uh, human being's shoulders. Oh, absolutely. It's not my fault. The devil made me do it. Don't blame me. It's the devil. I also think it's kind of funny the way they try to make the snake in the Garden of Eden look like the devil. Yeah, although there's no there's no text at all to, to back that up as anything except for a snake. The text explicitly calls the snake a snake. And never calls it the Satan and never calls it a devil or anything else. And in fact, I think that it says um, this is, uh, it was the most cunning of all of the animals that God made. So it's explicitly made by God. To be cunning, to be clever. To, yeah, to be clever. Yep. It's just another example of. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I was I was as guilty of this as anybody else. You spend so long being told what the text says. When you read it, you only hear what your recollection of it is, rather than what the words actually say. I'd like to know when, in the Christian, in the history of Christianity, the term devil and the term Satan became synonymous. Because in the Book of Revelation, chapter twelve, verse nine, you have the the statement. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. And it goes on from there. So at some point, the term the Satan was coalesced in the Christian concept of devil in the Christian mind. So Satan also appears, obviously, most famously in Job. Every time the Satan is mentioned in the Hebrew scriptures, the way in which the Satan is portrayed 
is radically different from the way in which he's portrayed in Christianity. So the Satan is a prosecuting attorney in the court where God is the judge and there is a defending attorney and there's a prosecuting attorney, uh, you know, a district attorney. And like in today's uh, world, the district attorney goes to the judge to do to get permission to run a sting operation. And that's what the Satan did. So in Job, uh, take a look at Job chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Okay, the, the Eternal said to Satan, actually it's the Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and, and, and eschews evil, and still he holds fast his integrity? And then the text reads, Although thou, now remember it's God who's speaking, although thou, that means the Satan, Move me, God, against him, against Job, to destroy him without cause. And the Satan answered the Eternal and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man has will he give for his life. But put forth your hand, that's God's hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Eternal said to Satan, Behold, it's in your hand, but save his life. He was arguing with God about the righteousness of Job and has to get permission from God to do anything to Job, just like a district attorney goes to the judge to get permission to get to do a sting operation to see whether or not people are moral or not. So this Satan has to work within the confines of his job description and can only do the things that God allows him to do. And it seems to me as well, he's not out to overthrow God. No, no he works for God. In the same way the DA or a prosecuting attorney works for the court, you know, is an employee of the court. The, the Satan is an employee of God, like any other angel, has to do God's bidding. The difference is, is that the task that the Satan has been assigned is to find out what the truth is. In the case of Job, is he really that righteous? And by the way, isn't it interesting, Jason, that the text says that Job was a perfect and upright man, one who fears God and eschews evil? Doesn't that show that human beings really can be righteous, as opposed to the Christian concept that we're all sinners and we cannot, without the help of God, become righteous people? Yeah, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 through 2, is a perfect description of the end of like a TV show like Law and Order. Because you've got the judge, which is God, who is rendering a verdict, and in this case, it's to side for the defense. Okay, Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the eternal and the Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the eternal said unto Satan, the eternal rebuke thee, O Satan, even the eternal that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So you have the high priest on trial who stands before the angel of the eternal, which is the defense attorney, and the Satan who's the accusing attorney, the prosecuting attorney, standing at his right hand to accuse him. But the judgment of God is to side for Joshua the high priest. Now, what's going on here? In Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, the Satan is basically saying, don't let the Jews go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Don't, don't, don't let Joshua be the high priest. He was sent into exile to begin with. You know, he's one of the sinners. So what is the idea of a brand plucked out of the fire? Jason, when I talked about this to congregants, I remind them how very urbanized we are. We're not used to being on the farm. We're not used to being, even though I live in Houston, Texas, okay, we're cowboys. We forget what a brand plucked out of the fire means. A brand plucked out of the fire means a brand that has been purified by being in the fire. And so what this is telling us is that God put Joshua the high priest in exile, the Jews in exile, like a brand is put in the fire because it purifies them. In other words, that's their punishment for their sin. But when the punishment is over, they're pure again. And so he's saying, Joshua the high priest, because he's been purified, has my permission to go back and be priest for the in Jerusalem. Uh, we're, we're familiar with brands here. We don't use... Um... We don't use the the hot ones anymore. Now it's all done with spray paint and tattoos. <laughs> so, 
So we've got this one from Psalm 109. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. Then he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. I guess a Christian would read that and assume that it's it's Satan's just waiting to take him away. But that's not the case, right? No, the Satan there is the an attorney, and the wicked man is being judged. And he said the judgment be that he is condemned, and his prayer become nothing, become sin, become useless. He's saying, let the man who's wicked be judged. Let the Satan be the prosecuting attorney prosecuting him, and let the judgment be that he is condemned for his sin, so that his prayer, oh, save me, you know, I'm, you know, forgive me, whatever, is, is uh, useless. If um, we were going to encourage people to go and um, do a little bit of study into Satan, would, uh, where would you start with Zoroastrianism, uh, which I had a little look at a few months ago? That would be a, a good, uh, interesting place to start. Seriously, Jason, I would have them start looking at the Ras Shamra texts with the myth of Athtar. If they just Google A T H. T-A-R, Athtar, uh, he's a Canaanite god of the underworld, and the Rashamra text and what it says about him, they're going to read there exactly the whole myth of a fallen angel who tried to rebel against God, uh, in this case against Baal the Almighty, uh, and who winds up being thrown down and becomes the king of the underworld, lord of the river of the dead. Because that, that really is probably the oldest reference to this mythology that creates the polytheism of a god in heaven above and a devil down or down below oh by the way you know something that that's always something that fascinates me you see this in movies and television and i think it's embedded in christian theology or christian popular theology i should say and that is the idea that i can sell my soul to the devil that's the stupidest thing always bothered me even as a kid how somebody could say that the biblical text is explicitly clear on this. Do you have the right to sell my computer? No. Nope. Why not? It's yours. It doesn't belong to you. That's right. Jason, our souls do not belong to us. We therefore do not have the right to sell our soul to the devil. They belong to God. All souls are mine, saith the Eternal. If God owns our soul, we don't have the right to sell it to a devil. It's not ours. It's God's. That's Ezekiel 18, isn't it? Yes. It's yeah. all, the idea of it, all souls are mine, saith the eternal, is found in a few other places, I believe. But yes, Ezekiel 18 explicitly says that. All souls are mine. And if God owns our souls, what right do we have to, quote unquote, as Christians would say, I sold my soul to the devil? It's, no, it's nonsense. You know, maybe one of the things we'll come back and do will be a little word study or a little a little study on the idea of um, Sheol and what happens after a person dies. All right, you know something? The fastest way you can find out if a translation of the Hebrew Scriptures is a good translation is to find a place where the text in the the Hebrew text uses the word Sheol and see if the translation translates it as hell. Okay, hell. You know, I, I'm very particular with words. Okay, very particular with the words we use and how we use them, and, and that we understand exactly what they mean. Hell has a very specific definition. Hell is the place the soul goes to to be tortured eternally in the next life for the sins that were committed in this life. What kind of God condemns somebody to be tortured for eternity? Eternity is a very long time. Mm. What would God get out of eternally torturing a soul? Okay, what, what, what possibly could a person do that would warrant eternally being tortured for the sins they committed in this life? It, it makes no sense. It's, that's... That is a small g God of cruelty, and that's not God with a capital G. That's a God of cruelty, not God. Judaism rejects the idea of hell because by definition, the word hell means to be eternally tortured in the next life for the sins we commit in this life. Judaism does believe in an afterlife. Judaism does believe that there's a punishment in the next life for the sins we commit in this life. But we believe that that punishment is temporary, temporal, it lasts a specific amount of time. Most traditions in Judaism say that a person doesn't warrant being uh, punished for their sins more than 11 months in one day into the 12th month, not even a full year. And then, like it says in Ecclesiastes, the dust returns to dust, the soul goes back to God who gave it. It doesn't say the Jewish spirit goes back to God who gave it. It doesn't say the good spirit goes back to God who gave it. Jews never believe that only Jews go to heaven. Jews always believe that every human being on earth is judged by God for 
their behavior, their actions, not their faith. Yes, faith may lead to actions, but the judgment is on the action, not on the belief system. And so everybody has a punishment in the next life for the sins they commit in this life. The punishment fits the sin, but there's a limit in time of that punishment. And when the, sin, when the punishment is over, the spirit goes back, the soul goes back to God who gave it, as it says in Ecclesiastes. And while we're talking about um, punishment and good and bad, uh, it might be a good time to um, pull the final verse that we have here from Isaiah 45, 5 through 7. I will read because it's awesome and I like reading it. <laughs> I am the Eternal, and there is no one else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, and though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Eternal, and there is no one else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Eternal, do all these things. So, such a great verse. Exactly, and I'm telling you, when we got to that verse in this introduction to Judaism conversion class, the minister was so incensed by that. And I said, but that's what the text says. It says, I make peace and create evil. How can you interpret that out of existence if the literal, simple, obvious meaning of the text is that God is responsible not only for the good, but also for the evil? Mm. And he basically got up and walked out and never came back. Well, hopefully he's taken some time to sit down and have a look himself, which we encourage all of our listeners to do. Uh, Judaism encourages everybody to read the Bible for themselves and to understand it, although, of course, within the framework of Judaism. Well, you know what? I think that wraps it up. I'd like to um, thank the listeners for joining us over these um, seven shows. And I'd like to thank you in particular, Rabbi Federer, for giving us your time. Always. Uh, my pleasure. Any way I can help you, Jason. <laughs> and encourage everyone to um, go and buy the book, Judaism and Christianity in Contrast. It expounds and expands on many more topics in much more detail than we can do in this show. And go and read the essays at whatjewsbelieve.org and uh, visit Rabbi Federo on Facebook. Follow him on Facebook and have a look at all his good stuff. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you all again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.